Yes, we are going. All right, folks, so welcome. Um, it is Thursday, October 10th. And folks, we'll do announcements first. So um, we will have an open lab tomorrow, Friday, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And it's for both lecture and lab questions. So if you have lab exam type questions or lecture questions, yeah. um, there are two new handouts. This little green one is the um, study guide for the next unit will start today, Microbial Genetics Part 1. And then the multi-page white handout, these are supplemental notes for um, microbial genetics part one. So DNA replication, transcription, and translation. And then let's see here, folks. So what we're going to do today, we are going to finish our um, microbial growth unit and then start in on our um, unit six, our microbial genetics. All right. And folks, of course, I forgot where we left off in microbial growth. Had we... Um, folks, had we gotten through a discussion of how temperature influences growth? We talked about the psychrophilic. Okay, oh, keep going, keep going, keep going. Thank you, stop. Right there. Like there? Okay, off. Oh, that's perfect. Great. Thanks, you guys. So, this is slide 14 of microbial growth. We're looking at how pH and osmotic pressure can influence the growth of microbes. And just as we had um, descriptive names for microbes that grow at different temperature ranges, likewise we have descriptive names for microbes that grow at different pH ranges. So folks, what would be your guess? What's an, uh, an acidophile? Yeah, a microbe that likes to grow at acidic pH, right, um, pH below 7. And certainly folks, our lactic acid bacteria that we had been discussing um, I would classify them as acidophiles. If we take fresh milk, for example, and we inoculate them with lactic acid bacteria and they perform lactic acid fermentation, the pH can drop from a pH of about 7 to pH of 4. So they're quite happy living at pH 4. We want to remember that the um, pH scale, it's a log scale, so each pH unit is a tenfold um, difference in hydrogen ion concentration. So the lactic acid bacteria then can increase hydrogen ion concentration a thousand fold in milk when they're carrying out fermentation, um, likewise in vegetables. And it's that low pH that will help inhibit the growth of spoilage microbes. So we'll be exploring how fermentation, we'll, we'll actually be repeating how fermentation can help preserve food in the absence of refrigeration. Uh, of interest, kind of, his, well, historical and medical interest, there is a bacterium that surprised everybody this bacterium is called Helicobacter pylori, and um, it can actually colonize the mucosa of the stomach. Now, way back when, when I was going to school, we were taught that no microbe can colonize the stomach. Why is that, folks? Yeah, really acidic, like probably down around pH 2, right? So everybody said you know, nobody can colonize the stomach. But then there were these crazy, wonderful Australian microbiologists. And they were like, we have found, we've discovered a bacterium that colonizes the stomach mucosa. And everybody laughed at them, right? They're like, oh, you crazy Australians, you know. And so it is so often people interested in parasitism will do, um, they said, well, we will prove it. So how do you think they proved that there's a bacterium that can colonize the stomach? They purposely infected themselves, right? So they swallowed a culture of this Helicobacter pylori, waited a while, and I'm presuming they did a, a, a stomach biopsy to prove the Helicobacter pylori was living in the mucosa of the stomach. So they went from being laughed at, I'm not sure they might have gotten a Nobel Prize for that work. And it's really fascinating, folks, because the Helicobacter, they've evolved strategies to deal with life in that really low pH. They have a urease that lets them make ammonia, which is a weak base, right? Um, the medical interest was that initially people thought if you were colonized with Hel Helicobacter pylori, it would increase your risk of ulcers of the stomach and duodenal ulcers of the intestine. And furthermore, which really frightened folks, there seemed to be an increased risk for stomach cancer if you were colonized with Helicobacter. So for many years, if you, um, if you were colonized, the, um, the treatment would be to try to kill the Helicobacter pylori, right? But 
But with further work in DNA analysis and recognizing there's different genetic strains of Helicobacter pylori, it was discovered there are some strains that might actually be helpful. They're low virulent. They don't increase the risk for stomach ulcers, nor do they increase the risk for stomach cancers. And indeed, folks, they actually decrease the risk of esophageal reflux disorder, right? And esophageal reflux can increase your risk for esophageal cancer. So they, they started seeing, well, okay, hmm, we're killing all the helicobacter, right? Maybe we're, we are reducing some of the stomach ulcers, stomach cancers, but they started seeing an increase in esophageal reflux, esophageal cancers, right? So they now have discovered there's beneficial strains of helicobacter pylori. They have probably co-evolved with us humans for many, many, many generations. So there's actually beneficial strains that, again, won't cause increase for ulcers or stomach cancers, will decrease the risk of esophageal reflux and esophageal cancers, right? It is true. There are some strains that are truly virulent that increase the risk for um, the stomach cancers and stomach ulcers. But some folks are saying maybe in the future we'll have probiotic helicobacter strains, you know, good beneficial strains that we'll take to help prevent esophageal reflux and esophageal cancer. So it's really fascinating. As humans, it seems like if we um, identify a new microbe, you know, we're quick to decide, oh, they're um, pathogens, well, let's kill them all, right? And then we discover later, well, hmm, there's some actually good strains here that actually help protect human health. Okay, then folks, um, um, how would you describe neutrophiles? Yeah, these are microbes that like to grow at neutral pH, around pH 7. And we would predict, you guys, that most of the microbes that invade humans, probably most of them are neutrophiles, right? At least if they're going to grow in the blood, right? Um, and then, folks, what do you think an alkalinophile is? Yeah, a microbe that can live very well at alkaline pH, pH above 7. And one of the examples is Vibrio cholera. This is a bacterium that causes the diarrheal disease, um, cholera. And if we have time in the um, microbial genetic section, Vibrio cholera has an absolutely fascinating kind of natural history, its ability to, to live in our intestines and cause a watery diarrhea. But furthermore, its ability to live in the environment Right, so I'm hoping we'll have time to talk about some of the amazing genetics behind Vibrio cholera. Okay, so that's all we're going to say about um, uh, classification of the microbes. And then, folks, the other thing we want to do is take a look at how osmotic pressure, solute concentration of the environment can help um, influence the growth of microbes. So, folks, you'll recall that in discussing bacteria and bacteria cell walls, we talked about hypoosmotic environments. <laughs> And when we're talking about um, solute concentrations, water concentrations, we're always comparing two compartments. So we're always comparing the inside of our cell to the outside. So you guys, in a hypoosmotic environment, which compartment has a higher solute concentration? We'll use red dots as solutes. So in a hypoosmotic environment, folks, which compartment has higher solutes inside the cell or outside? Okay, so in this case, it's, it's going to be inside, right? The cells often living in environments where there aren't a lot of nutrients present, and so they're actively transporting nutrients into the cell. They're making metabolic waste products. There's ions present. So we're going to have solutes outside the cell will be what? Lower or higher than inside? Low? Okay. So solutes inside are going to be high. And remember, folks, that solutes take up space, right? So the more solutes there are, the less water there is. So folks, which compartment will have a higher water concentration? Okay, so it's going to be outside, right? So we're going to have higher water outside than inside. And what will be the result, folks? What will be the net flow of water from inside out or outside in? Outside in, right? And we said that that endangered the microbes, especially if they lack a cell wall. They might die from which process? Osmotic lysis. Okay, so now, folks, we're going to 
we're going to change the environment. Let's make this a um, hypertonic or hyperosmotic environment. Let's compare that. Okay, so here's our cell. And let's see, folks, the way we're going to do this is we're going to add salt or sugar. Right? So we're purposely going to add these are solutes. So in a hyperosmotic environment, Let's compare the two compartments, folks. So which compartment now has a higher solute concentration, inside the cell or outside? Outside, right? Because we're adding salt and sugar. Like this is our salt and sugar. We're intentionally adding it. So with regard to solutes, folks, which compartment now has the higher solute concentration? Outside. Yeah, outside. So we have high outside we have low inside again we're always comparing compartments and as a result folks what about water concentration which compartment will have the higher water concentration inside. yeah inside right so folks in a hyperosmotic environment what will be what will be the net flow of water in which direction no. yeah right we're going to dehydrate ourselves right so this is going to lead to dehydration Right? And often the little cell, it shrivels, it shrinks up like that. Now, why would dehydration slow down the growth of our microbes? Why is water important in cells? Is water involved in chemical reactions? Yeah, it is, right? Do you think, folks, without water, we might have a change in shape of some of our organic molecules, like some of our um, proteins, right? Because remember, hydrophobic interactions, right? are going to influence the shape of our organic molecules. Yeah? So, okay, so at the very least, with dehydration, r reduce the growth of our microbes, right? Right? Won't be able to grow and replicate. Okay, so we're going to inhibit growth, maybe outright kill them, right? Now, can you think of a situation, let's, let's say that we're living in a time where there's no refrigeration, or maybe right now with all the PG&E blackouts, right? You have no refrigerator, but you need to preserve your food. How, what might be a low-tech way to preserve your food? Because you want to prevent the growth of spoilage microbes, right? That's our goal, so prevent growth of spoilage microbes to preserve your food. What have our ancestors done for generations? That's it, adding salt or sugar to our foods, right? And so maybe they didn't understand at the time why this was helpful, right? But historically, sometimes in some places, um, salt is more valuable than jewels, right? Because the salt was so important for preserving foods um, when no refrigeration was available. So in this PowerPoint slide book, we just have some examples. Um, this is meat that's been salted, right? So again, um, it can be preserved in the absence of refrigeration. Um, one way we can preserve the nutri nutritive value, say, of fruits is to add sugars, right? And this is like an example would be to make jellies or jams, right? What about honey, you guys? Do you think honey, um, if you added honey to a um, food, might that create a hyperosmotic environment? Yeah. And, and furthermore, you guys, honey has a lot of antimicrobial substances in it. And indeed, we uh, in the Monday Wednesday group, Remember how we were talking about hydrogen peroxide in the old days? We'd use it as an antiseptic, but now they're saying try not to use it you know, because it can cause tissue damage. So one of the alternatives is medical grade honey, right? And using medical grade honey to help inhibit the growth of uh, microbes that can cause infections, right? Um, so really fascinating kind of these applications. But folks, I wanna, I wanna warn you, do you think some microbes that um, have evolved to live in high salt environments, do you think they might be resistant to the salting of our meats? They might be able to grow there? Yeah, and this is, this is one of my favorite stories. And again, I have to thank my husband for being such a good sport because he's often the, um, he often supplies a lot of good microbial stories. So my husband is really conservative. He doesn't want to waste things. And it makes him crazy 
if there's food in the refrigerator and it's like maybe going bad, he's just, he's just that's horrible to waste food. So this was a few years ago. Um, we were in the kitchen. He was going through the refrigerator looking for things maybe that were starting to get a little bit on the old side. And he found these, these um, rather aged salted sausages. Now, salted sausages, you know, we would think, okay, the salt should inhibit the growth of spoilage microbes, right? So he started eating the salted sausages, and I laugh. I have the weirdest sense of humor. He was okay, but I'm, I started laughing. I was excited because suddenly he has what's called projectile vomiting. <laughs> projectile vomiting, folks, it's like I could stand here and maybe hit the wall over there. I mean, it was so amazing. It was like, whoa, like that. And I was like, Staph aureus, enterotoxin, right? It was like right out of the textbooks. So there's a couple of points to this story, folks. So let's think about this. These were, these were salted meats, right? Should inhibit the growth of microbes. But let's think about it, folks. Where does Staphylococcus aureus um, normally live? On our skin, right? As a kid, in the summertime, folks, did you ever, maybe after you've gone swimming, you're lying on the hot cement, did you ever lick your skin? We did as kids. I don't know, maybe we were weird. But how does your skin taste? Salty, right? So the salt from the sweat for evaporative cooling, the salt is also antimicrobial, right? Well, if Staph aureus has evolved to live on the skin, say, of humans, right, has there been natural selection for Staph aureus that can live in really high salt environments? Yeah, that's kind of unusual, gesundheit. And we'll see in lab, folks, we can use that um, characteristic to select for the growth of Staphylococcus aureus. We're going to grow them in media that has a really high salt concentration, 7.5% um, weight per volume. That's 7.5 grams of sodium chloride per 100 mils. That's really salty. That will inhibit the growth of most microbes, but good old Staphylococcus aureus can grow at that high levels. So folks, does it make sense that if we have salted meat, could Staphylococcus aureus grow in that salted meat? It's possible, right? And furthermore, some strains of Staphylococcus aureus, they have the genes to make a protein toxin called enterotoxin. Entero means intestines, right? So the Staph aureus growing on the meat, it's making the enterotoxin. So when you eat that food, right, you're swallowing the enterotoxin. You're going to suffer from an intoxication, and it's often rapid onset, right, because it's preformed, right? And thus we get the projectile vomiting. Is that an infection? No, it's an intoxication, right? And furthermore, folks, this enterotoxin is unusual in that it's relatively heat stable. These enterotoxins are made, are made of proteins, and we'll learn later, usually protein toxins, we, if we heat them, what will happen to them? They'll denature, right? So usually think, oh, if I cook the food, it should denature the protein toxin. But the Staph aureus enterotoxin is unusually heat resistant. So even if those salted sausages had been cooked, maybe microwaved or cooked, um, it might be that that would not have been in inactivated the enterotoxin, right? And we still would have gotten that awesome projectile vomiting. I wish I had a video to show you guys. It was really amazing, yeah? My husband, he's so good-natured, yeah. But he's, he was okay. He was okay. It was good. Why is it good to vomit? Yeah, you're getting rid of the toxin, right? And it was so fast onset. I, I think it was less than a minute, and he was... So he got it all out of his system, and he was fine. But no more eating old, salty sausages for us. OK. And, and again, folks, this is just trying to um, relate how humans have used um, fermentations of foods to preserve the nutritive value in the absence of refrigeration. So folks, the lactic acid bacteria that can ferment milk products into yogurt, kefir, cheese, um, Buttermilk, right? Yeah. Um, those lactic acid bacteria can also ferment v vegetables. So um, we have traditional fer fermented foods like um, fermented cabbage in many different cultures of the world. That low pH helps uh, prevent the growth of spoilage microbes. The low pH, you guys, it has a sour taste to us. So if you, if you swallow fresh milk, it's kind of sweet. Then if you swallow, say, buttermilk or kefir, it's sour. That's how we detect that low, low pH, the high hydrogen ions. And also, folks, we want to remember that alcoholic fermentation can help preserve the nutritive value, say, of grape juice or um, of grains, right? So if we carry out alcoholic fermentation in, say, grape juice or fermented grains, we end up with, like with fruit 
with fruit juice, it would be wine, considered wine, right? And if we're doing it on fermented grains, we end up with beer, yeah. So it, it's, it might be that humans stumbled upon fermentation as a way to preserve food in the absence of refrigeration, right? And, and, and there's a lot of really people that have really sensitive taste, uh, sensitive, have um, the ability to, to distinguish many different flavors. Um, they say, you know, the fermentation products impart really beautiful, rich, delicious flavors to the foods, yeah. So, yeah, here in California, fermentation, big industry for us, okay. And folks, this is just, um, um, just another reminder, um, kind of a totally different subject, folks, but we were talking about how to inhibit the growth of microbes right through fermentation, for example, or adding um, salt or sugar. Um, but we do want to remember that um, in biofilms, um, we could argue that the growth of the bacteria in the lower layers of the biofilm, because they don't have access to as many nutrients, they're, they aren't going to be actively growing. They're going to be in that stationary phase of growth. So we always want to remember that bacterial pathogens living in biofilms in your patient, are they easier to kill than free-floating bacteria, or are they harder to kill? They're harder to kill, right? And one of the reasons is they're in that stationary phase of growth, and they're naturally more resistant to, to antibiotics. So folks, probably for sure on the um, lecture exam too, an, another, and I haven't decided if it would be a short answer question or multiple choice, but I'll definitely ask you why is it that pathogenic bacteria living in biofilms in a human patient are so much harder to kill than the free-floating bacteria. Okay, so remember those biofilms are really challenging to deal with the pathogens. Okay, I think the last few slides, you guys, I think we're gonna, um, um, we're gonna skip the last few slides. These have to do with, for example, growth factors that microbes need. Um, if we were to grow microbes in the lab, you know, what, what do we need to supply them with? The only thing I would like to introduce folks, because it's a term we'll probably see in lab, I would like to introduce you to the concept of what we call fastidious bacterial pathogens, because we'll be talking about fastidious bacterial pathogens in lab when we're talking about microbial growth media. So fastidious bacterial pathogens So fastidious means we, um, we must have a supply of preformed what are called growth factors. So growth factors to replicate. And usually we talk about growth factors as in three basic groups. So for example, uh, preformed amino acids. Um, preformed precursors um, of um, nucleic acids. So, for example, the nitrogenous bases and um, vitamins. So, vitamins, remember, folks, one role of vitamins is they, they're crucial in making coenzymes. Yeah. So, fastidious bacterial pathogens, they usually have really simple enzyme systems. So they can't make their own amino acids. They can't make their own nitrogen spaces. So if we want to grow them in the lab, we have to supply them with those preformed um, growth factors. So this means in the lab, we must grow the fastidious pathogens in really rich media. And rich meaning rich um, in preformed organic molecules, so we make sure we're gonna we're gonna provide them with all the growth factors they need. And a simple way to do this, folks, and we'll talk about it more in lab, is we're gonna add blood. We're gonna add blood to our auger, or blood to our media, right? Because blood is chock full of what? All these wonderful preformed organic molecules, yeah. And and the reason this is important to know, folks, do you think a lot of the um, pathogens that invade us are fastidious? 
yeah, why are they invading us? Because we, we represent a wonderful source of those preformed uh, growth factors, right? So it makes sense that if you're sending a sample from a patient and you think the patient has some microbial infection, you send it to the lab, the lab needs to make sure that they, they um, um, transfer the sample to really rich media, right, to make sure they can grow any fastidious pathogens. Otherwise, if the pathogens are starving, they won't grow. It could end up with a false negative result, right? So again, folks, this will become more important in lab, but I just wanted to introduce you to the vocabulary fastidious pathogens, okay? And therefore, folks, the other slides, again, we're going to be talking about microbial growth media in lab, so I'm going to leave the, the remaining slides as a lab topic. It, that would be unit, uh, chapter 10, unit 10 in lab. And with that, folks, we're going to close microbial growth do you have any questions, you guys, when you were studying that, any questions? I know a lot of you are like, we're, we're focused on the lab exam right now, so don't bug us about lecture. Okay. So then, folks, we're finished unit five, microbial growth, and now we're going to start probably the longest unit in the course, and this is on microbial genetics. And it is amazing, folks, the information explosion in science. When I started college, well, actually, let me, let me back up, you guys. Um, I was born in 1956, so the structure of DNA was first described by um, Watson and Crick in 1953, right? So when I was born, people were just starting to understand the structure of DNA. So subsequently, when I went to college, they didn't know that much about genetics, which was really helpful because my introductory biology classes, you know, we weren't overwhelmed with information, yeah? But now, folks, in our introductory micro, uh, microbial genetics lectures that we think are just foundations, we're, we're describing topics that I got in graduate school, right? I mean, those were like the, the new frontier topics. And now we consider this is part of an introductory uh, microbiology course. So I just want you to appreciate how overwhelming this information is going to be. And again, folks, as always, you just want to make sure, try to study, if you can, try to study every day, because it's a lot of information, a lot of new vocabulary to digest. You don't want to leave it to the last minute, OK? So those of you that have had anatomy and physiology, a lot of this will be review for you, OK? But we are going to focus on bacteria, not eukaryotic cells. So there will be some differences, OK, as we go. Gesundheit. And we'll do the microbial genetics in two PowerPoints. So this will be PowerPoint 1 or PowerPoint 8. And this is going to cover specifically, folks, DNA replication, transcription, and translation. And as always, there's so many details. It's really easy to get lost amongst all the details. So I will always try to come back to this big roadmap, you guys. This is called the Central Dogma of Information Flow in Cells. It was described by Francis Crick of the famous Watson and Crick duo. Okay? And so we'll always come back to this as our roadmap. If we get lost, we're going to come back to this to find out where are we. What street are we on, right? So let's put this up on the board. Okay, so this is the central dogma. of information flow in cells. And I'm going to underline cells because we're going to see our viruses laugh at us. We come up with all these rules and the viruses are just going to laugh at it like, oh yeah? Yeah. We'll show you how we're going to break that rule. Okay. So folks, um, in this cartoon, we're going to start out with DNA and we're going to have an arrow that originates with DNA and then points right back at it. Right. So this is our cartoon for DNA replication, the ability to copy the DNA, right? And um, I'd like to int start introducing some terminology here, you guys. So when we make, when we start making nucleic acids, DNA or RNA, we always have to have a guide, and the fancy name for the guide we call it the template. So this is your guide. Um, to make DNA, to make RNA. And we always ask ourselves in, in this um, information flow, what's the template and what's being made? 
So this cartoon, folks, is telling us DNA is going to act as a template, and we're going to make DNA, right? And let's just do it, you guys, for DNA replication. And you know how to do this already. So templates are always single strand, either DNA or RNA. So let's do a single strand DNA. Okay. And I'm just going to make up some nitrogenous base <coughs> sequence here. So this is going to be our template. And now, folks, I'm going to have you act as the enzyme that uses a DNA template to make a complementary strand. So you're going to be the DNA polymerase. Okay. So you're going to synthesize a complementary strand using this template. So you guys, help me out. What will the complementary strand, the nitrogenous base, be? A. Okay, so the enzymes that make nucleic acid, they have to have a guide or a template, right? You guys, you did a beautiful job. This is exactly the correct nitrogenous base sequence for the newly synthesized DNA, right? And how did you know the base sequence here? You had a guide, a template. Okay. So in DNA replication, what's the template? DNA. And what are you going to make? DNA. Good. Good job, you guys. Now, this must occur before a cell does what? Before it divides in two, right? Remember, folks, remember in the standard microbial or bacterial growth curve, remember that lag phase where it looked like nothing was happening, right? Well, the cells were getting ready to divide in two. What was one of the things they had to do? They had to copy of the chromosomal DNA, right? Because each, each of the daughter cells had to get a copy of the chromosome. Okay, so this is a really cool process. And this might take us maybe the rest of the lecture today. All right, so we'll talk about DNA replication required um, for <coughs> chromosome replication before the cell divides. But then, you know, we kind of want to say, well, why is DNA so important? Everybody says, you know, DNA is the genetic blueprints of the cell. So what does that mean? So you'll recall, folks, the DNA base sequence encodes the information for the amino acid sequence of proteins, right? And then those proteins, many of them will become enzymes that will help make mi many of the other comp components of the cell. So it's kind of wild. How are we going to get from a DNA base sequence into amino acid sequence? That's kind of a wild process, right? And we're going to see it requires two steps. In the first step, folks, the DNA is going to act as a template to make RNA. All right? So DNA will act as a template to make RNA. This process is called transcription. And again, folks, you, you know how to do this already. Let's say this is our single strand. DNA template, and again, just going to make some random um, DNA sequence here. Now, folks, let's have you act as RNA polymerase. What do you think RNA polymerase does? What do you think RNA polymerase makes? RNA, right? So, you guys, let's pretend you're RNA polymerase. This is your single strand DNA template. What will be the base sequence? of the complementary RNA. So C, okay, A. Okay, now remember, that's the one, the one thing we have to remember you guys is in RNA, there's not thymine, there's uracil, right? Good, and then finish, G, G, G. Okay, so you guys, you just transcribe the DNA into RNA. You just transcribe the DNA into RNA, right? So that process was called, what again? Transcription. And then this next step, you guys, is absolutely phenomenal. The next step, the RNA will act as a template to make proteins. And notice how we're now we're switching from nucleic acid language into the language of proteins. We're switching from an alphabet of nitrogenous bases to an alphabet of amino acids. So we call this process, you guys, this amazing process is called, we're changing languages. So what do we call changing languages? Translation, yeah. And it, it's, it's an incredible event, right? Um, so what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to look at the central dogma of information flows over the next um, few lectures, OK? Now, remember how I said viruses love to laugh at us, right? So in cells, this is how information is supposed to flow. DNA acts as a guide to make more DNA. DNA acts as a guide to make RNA. RNA acts as a guide to make proteins, right? 
But do you think there's viruses that laugh at us? Like, oh, 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 yeah, laughing virus, right? But we want to remember that in some viruses, they can drive information flow backwards, right? Some viruses, folks, have RNA as their genetic information. They can use their RNA as a guide to make what? To make DNA, right? It's, that's not transcription. It's reverse transcription. And indeed, the enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. There's a family of viruses called the retroviruses, the backwards viruses. Right? They carry out reverse transcription. The most infamous heartbreaking of these guys, who's a retrovirus that causes all kinds of heartache, heartbreak, HIV? Okay. So if I got infected today with HIV, folks, and the HIV got into my um, cells, it'll use its um, RNA genome as a guide to make a DNA copy of its genetic information, and then it's going to insert that DNA copy where? Into my chromosomes. And once it gets in there, we can't get it out, right? So just remember, folks, the viruses are going to laugh at all of our rules for cells, right? Okay, but we're going to focus on bacteria cells, right? And um, after genetics, we will do viruses, right? So we'll kind of see how do cells do it, and then we'll see how do viruses do it. Yeah. Okay. So, folks, what we're going to do today, and it'll probably take the rest of the lecture, we're just going to focus on DNA replication in bacteria. Bacteria are our little model organisms. Um, in most of our examples, it'll be E. coli that'll act as our model organism. Um, e. coli was kind of the workhorse of early bacterial genetics, so we often um, refer to the E. coli. So just to introduce, and a lot of review here, folks, so again, um, the structure of DNA was first described by uh, James Watson and Francis Crick only in 1953, right? But that's not that long ago. Um, they described it as the double helix, the double, beautiful double helix, two spiral strands of DNA held together by hydrogen bonds between complementary bases. Um, they received the Nobel Prize along with Maurice Wilkins. It was, it was kind of too bad because there was a, a fourth scientist, Rosalind Franklin, who pro provided the X-ray uh, crystallographs that Watson and Crick used to come up with the, um, the double helix model. But she died before the Nobel Prizes were awarded. And they have a rule, if you're dead, you can't get a Nobel Prize. But we, we try to remember that she also was an important part of the team. And again, folks, we're going to be focused on E. coli. So here's an electron micrograph of a single little E. coli. What's all this spaghetti? It's a single circular chromosome. Isn't that crazy, you guys? How, how does a little bacteria that pack all that inside? And we'll, we'll talk about how it does that. And that's just amazing. But can you imagine, folks, having to copy all of this before you divide in two? What a job. Oh, my goodness. And folks, not, not to worry about this, but with bacteria, with their circular chromosomes, um, studies have been done where they can actually locate where specific genes are on the chromosome. And so, it, and again, folks, not to worry about this, but blue is amino um, acid metabolism. The kind of violet is DNA replication repair. Um, we have lipid metabolism genes, carbohydrate metabolism genes, and membrane synthesis genes. And what struck me, you guys, was how many genes, how much of the chromosome deals with DNA replication and DNA repair, right? So a lot of the chromosome is encoding the information for DNA replication and repair. And again, folks, just to review, because talking about DNA replication, we need to know the structure. So um, the DNA is a polymer, a polymer made up of nucleotides, and specifically, folks, it's a polymer of what we call nucleoside monophosphates, right? So remember in DNA we have a five carbon sugar or pentose. And folks, remember the convention is the carbons in the five carbon deoxyribose um, have a prime number to distinguish them from the carbons in the nitrogenous phase. So in our, um, our nucleoside monophosphates, we have the nitrogenous phase is covalent related to carbon one prime of our sugar. And what's attached to carbon five prime of our sugar? 
the phosphate group. Good. And folks, um, looking at this nucleoside um, monophosphate here, we want to remember this is really important. This hydroxyl group on the three prime carbon is going to be important. And then the phosphate group attached here to the five, car uh, five prime carbon will, will be important. This is just showing the complementary um, base pairing between adenine and thymine. So remember, folks, in DNA, adenine can form two hydrogen bonds with thymine, and cytosine can form three hydrogen bonds with, with guanine. Okay, so do remember those complementary base pairing rules. That is what permits the precise replication of DNA, and that's often an exam question. So what permits precise replication of DNA? It's the complementary base pairing rules. Good. And again, just more review, folks. So, okay, so the, um, the strands of DNA are polymers and nucleotides, and we talk about the DNA base sequence, or the DNA sequence is the sequence of nitrogenous bases, and folks, um, a strand of DNA, it's going to have a five prime end, this is kind of like the head, this is where if we cut the DNA, we have uh, the nucleotide with the free five prime phosphate, that's the head end, and the tail end is the end of the strand, it has a free three prime hydroxyl end. So this is like the start and the end. When we do a base sequence, we always start at the five prime end. So this would be base one, two, three, and four. Remember, well, hopefully we talk about this a little, little bit. In double-stranded DNA, the two strands are what we call anti-parallel, meaning the complementary strand, the three prime tail is adjacent to the five prime head, right? So that's what we call anti-parallel. And that will become important, folks, when we start talking about DNA replication. Right? So we're going to see that when we synthesize DNA, it has to be anti-parallel to the template, and that's going to cause some headaches. The covalent linkage between the nucleotides is not a single bond, it's a bridge of bonds. And the bridge of bonds is called the phosphodiester um, bond. So we've got uh, um, an, basically an alcohol and acid here, so there's an ester bond there. Again, we have the equivalent of an alcohol and an acid here. So that's another es ester bond. So diester, phosphodiester bond is the covalent linkage that holds the nucleotides together. Again, the DNA, it, um, the chromosomal DNA is double-stranded. It's helical and thus the double helix. The strands are held together by the hydrogen bonds, right? Complementary base pairs, the strands are anti-parallel. And often, folks like some of the analogies that folks use is that the double-stranded DNA, it's like a ladder, right? So the alternating sugar <coughs> phosphates are like the sides of the ladder, and then the steps are the um, complementary bases with their hydrogen bonds, right? Okay. <coughs> All right, so folks, um, what we'll do is we'll kind of start kind of superficially. Again, it's like the onion. We're going to start peeling layers off of this. So we want to, big picture, describe how a bacterium will use its chromosome as a template to make two chromosome copies. So we just want to do it kind of superficially, and then we'll get into a lot of detail. All right, folks, so let's just say this is this is our bacterial chromosome, and I'll show it linear just for ease of drawing. So um, we want to remember it's made up of double-stranded, so DS stands for double-stranded DNA. And folks, what I'll do is let's call this the old parental, old um, parent uh, chromosome. Right, so it's double-stranded DNA. So when the bacterium is getting ready to divide, right, it has to make a copy of its chromosomes. So the way it's going to do it, it's going to unzip. And one of your colleagues made this. I love things like this. Um, one of your colleagues made this model of DNA like a zipper, right? So the, uh, the sugar phosphate back goes here. 
And then the teeth represent the um, hydrogenous bases, complementary bound, right? So when the bacteria needs to copy the chromosome, it's going to unzip the double stranded DNA. And this gets stuck sometimes. You guys probably back up in the cells, too. You see that? Right? So now we've gone from double stranded DNA. Now we've gone to two single strand templates, right? And then each of the single strand templates will guide synthesis of a complementary DNA strand. So we're going to unzip our double stranded DNA to create two single strand DNA templates. Okay, so single strand DNA templates. And remember, you guys, these are the, the old parent strands. So this is parental. DNA. This is parental DNA. And then DNA polymerase, just like you guys did previously, DNA polymerase will come along, use the old parent strand as a template to make what? Here's the new um, complementary single strand DNA. Okay, so here and here. Right. So once the chromosome is copied, right now we have two copies of the chromosome. Now the cell can divide in two, right? And each of the so-called daughter cells will inherit one copy of the chromosome. Now, folks, see how in each of the new chromosomes, so this, this is a new chromosome and this is a new chromosome. See how one old parent strand has been saved or conserved, right? And then there's a new daughter strand made. This type of DNA replication is called semi-conservative. Meaning that one old parent strand is conserved or saved, used as a template for synthesis of a new um, daughter DNA strand. Does that make sense, folks? Yeah, there was a lot of debate on how, you know, the DNA replication was then. They finally determined it was this semi-conservative model. And in this cartoon, folks, we can see this is the old parental double-stranded DNA. It's unzipping, right, so that each of the old parent strands acts as a template for synthesis of a new complementary DNA strand. We go from one chromosome to two chromosomes. Each of the new chromosomes has one old parent strand and one new uh, uh, daughter DNA strand. Right, and this is just to make sure that I remember to tell you this is semi-conservative DNA replication. Okay, folks, so now we're, we're working our way into looking at all the details of DNA replication. So one thing we need to remember is for the cell to carry out DNA replication, it has to have these per, uh, what, we'll what we'll call charge precursors. And the charged precursors the cell needs are nucleoside triphosphates. Nucleoside triphosphates. And the reason for this is DNA synthesis requires a lot of energy, right? It's biosynthesis, it's anabolism. And so the nucleoside triphosphates, they're carrying their own energy with, with them to help drive DNA synthesis. And you might recall, folks, that we, in our nucleoside triphosphates, we use this tilde sign to represent a covalent bond, which upon hydrolysis will release a certain amount of energy. So the DNA polymerase can harvest some of that energy to drive DNA synthesis. So again, we just want to recognize the cell needs these nucleoside triphosphates before it can begin DNA synthesis. This is a little bit confusing, folks, this cartoon. So let me see if I can get you oriented. So we're looking at, say, E. coli that's uh, replicating its chromosome. Here's one of the old parent strands right here. This is one of the new strands that's being synthesized using the parent strand as a template. So folks, do notice that we have an anti-parallel arrangement between the old parent strand and the new strand here. So the 5' prime end of the new strand is adjacent to the 3' prime hydroxyl end of the old strand. And this is really important, folks. Notice that DNA synthesis is, a, is occurring in what we call a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The reason for this is that incoming nucleotides can only be added to the 3' prime hydroxyl end of the new strand, right? And, and again, folks, we have cartoons for all of this. So we say that um, DNA synthesis 
occurs in a five prime to three prime direction. And the way we cartoon this, folks, is we put our five prime, this would be our five prime phosphate head, and then we have an arrow pointing to the three prime hydroxyl tail, because this is where incoming nucleotides will be added, okay, only to the three prime hydroxyl tail. So again, uh, synthesis is always five prime to three prime. And again, folks, when we start looking at the details, of DNA replication in bacteria, we're going to see this is going to create a lot of problems for the little bacteria. Okay. Now, when the um, DNA polymerase is going to catalyze formation of a covalent bond between the oxygen of this hydroxyl group and the phosphorus atom of the innermost phosphate, in the process, these two, um, two terminal phosphate groups, we call them a pyrophosphate, this covalent bond will be hydrolyzed, releasing energy, right? So here's the two phosphates that are getting released, little pyrophosphate group, uh, groups will be released. And then we'll see in the next slide, here's, okay, so the, uh, oxygen is gonna form a new covalent bond with the innermost phosphorus of that phosphate. There's that new um, covalent bond formed right here. Right? So here we have our our uh, nucle nucleoside monophate phosphate with the thymine, and then that pyrophosphate is released. And subsequently, this human gets hydrolyzed, so more energy is released to help drive the human synthesis. You, you need not remember this, folks, but in the biochemical books, they describe this as a nucleophilic attack between the oxygen and that innermost phosphorus. The oxygen has those two um, pairs of non-bonding electrons, negative charges, and they're really attracted to the nucleus of that innermost um, phosphorus. That's just detail. I would never ask that on the exam. Okay. All right, folks, so now what we're going to do is we're going to pretend we have a powerful electron uh, microscope and that we're actually watching an E. coli make a copy of its chromosome. Um, so again, we're looking at this kind of in the big picture and then we're going to zoom in to look at all the details. So there's some terminology we want to have under our belts. So again, this will be um, chromosome replication in E. coli. So remember, it's a bacterium. It has a single circular chromosome. And basically what we're going to do, folks, we're going to go from one chromosome. We're going to end up with two chromosomes, right? All right. So folks, if what I will cartoon on the board is the double-stranded DNA of the E. coli chromosome, it's not a nucleus. Some people, some students in the past said, we thought you were drawing a nucleus. It's like, nope. This is the double-stranded DNA of the E. coli chromosome. And if we were using our powerful electron micrograph, what we would see is that if we use the circular chromosome as a clock, so these are the two strands of DNA, up, uh, up around 12 o'clock, we would see what, what looks like a bubble forming, a little bubble forming, and that bubble is called the replication bubble. It's always going to form at a very specific DNA sequence called the origin of replication. So this is a specific DNA sequence called the origin of replication, a very specific site on the chromosome where the chromosome replication always begins. And again, you guys, you know, as biologists, we're so bad, so we short it to ORI, right? So we'll have a, an ORI on that strand and ORI down here. And again, that's where chromosome replication will begin. If we were these little tiny micro people, and folks, let's say the double-stranded DNA is kind of the path, and we're walking along the path, we come to the replication um, bubble, and you see there's a fork, right? A fork where the two strands are um, separated. And indeed, that is called the replication fork. It's where all the enzymes and proteins involved in DNA replication are madly at work. So we've got a replication fork here and a replication fork 
Now, again, if we were patient, we were watching this chromosome replication occur, it would appear as if the replication forks are moving in opposite directions around the chromosome. And again, folks, this is one of the characteristics of DNA replication. It's described as bidirectional. Right? It's going to move in both directions around the chromosome. So we're moving, replication is going to move this way and this way. So bidirectional replication. And again, the events at the replication fork is the DNA is being copied. So eventually, folks, the replication forks, they're going to, they're going to work their way all the way around till about like 6 o'clock, if this was a clock. And at this point, this sequence called the termination of replication, or TER, the chromosome replication is complete. And we've gone from one chromosome to two. So let's use the PowerPoint slide. Let me, let me tell folks what slide this is. In our PowerPoint, folks, this is slide 14, OK? So we'll use the PowerPoint um, slide to walk through these same events. So you guys, so here's our double-stranded bacterial chromosome, right? Where will replication begin? The origin of replication. Okay, this looks like a bubble. What's the bubble called? The uh, replication bubble, right? And this area and this area, what are those areas called? The replication forks, right? And that's where all the active DNA synthesis is occurring. So folks, what we're seeing here is the replication forks are moving in opposite directions, so bidirectional replication. They keep moving around the chromosome using the single strands as templates to make new strands, and eventually they'll meet where? Termination and replication, yeah. And it's at that point that we've gone from one chromosome to two, and the two copies separate, and now the cell can divide in two. So folks, what we're gonna do, and this will take probably the rest of this lecture, maybe part of Tuesday's lecture, we're gonna zoom in on one of those replication forks and look at all the steps, all the proteins, all the enzymes that's required to make a copy of the DNA. It's pretty amazing. And we're gonna see, folks, that the, um, the bacteria, they have lots of problems to um, overcome in making a copy of their chromosomal DNA. So what, this might be one suggestion, folks. You might wanna have one piece of paper, landscape, or longitudinal for the diagrams we're gonna put up here. You might want another piece of paper, folks, for a problem solutions list, because we're gonna describe the, the, um, the obstacles the bacteria have to overcome, solve, to copy their DNA. And it's just like one problem after the other, and they've found solutions for each of these problems. Okay. So again, folks, um, what, I'll, what I'll be doing here is drawing a magnifying replication fork. And then over on the sideboard, and gosh, I'm losing my, uh, losing my screen here. Um, we'll be writing a problems and solution list over here on the, on the side of the board. So we'll do DNA replication. We'll say a problem, problems, and then solutions. And folks, this is often how I'll ask it on the exam, right? I'll give you a little table and say, here's a problem. You tell me what was the solution that the bacteria evolved, OK? So the first problem, folks, remember that cartoon? Not the cartoon, but the electron micrograph of that single little E. coli that had been lysed, and it released all that chromosomal DNA, and we're saying, that's crazy. How does all that chromosomal DNA get packed in that tiny bacterium? And the answer, folks, is this amazing process called supercoiling. So if we can pretend that my, um, my, my key ring here is the circular chromosomal DNA, the bacteria have these cool enzymes called topoisomerases that can supercoil the chromosome. So I'm supercoiling the chromosome right now, folks. And you'll notice as I'm coiling it, it's getting packed tighter and tighter and tighter. 
And I'll do, we'll just put a little, a little bacterium here. So this could be our E. coli, right? So by supercoiling, the bacteria can pack the chromosomal DNA so tightly that it can do what? Yeah, fit into that little tiny cell. Yeah, it's kind of like when um, uh, you're trying to pack a lot of clothes maybe into a suitcase. You roll them really tight to try to get as many into your suitcase as you can. But, folks, remember how we said for the chromosome to be replicated, what do we have to do to it? We have to unzip it, right? And it would be impossible to unzip the supercoiled chromosome. So the chromosome has to be relaxed. It ha we have to relieve the supercoiling before we can unzip the double-stranded DNA to start chromosome replication. So, you guys, let's put that as the first problem, that the, uh, the chromosome is supercoiled. Okay, and so the problem is it must be relaxed. We would call it, we want to relax the supercoiling. And as you might guess, there's a special bacterial enzyme that's involved in relaxing the supercoil, right, so that we can start DNA replication. So the solution is an enzyme we're going to call, folks, bacterial gyrase. And I, I, I do want you to know bacterial gyrase. Um, in, our, in your readings, folks, this is an example of a topoisomerase 2, oops, sorry, topo, topoisomerase 2. You don't need to remember that. I'll, I'll just ask you uh, about bacterial gyrase. So bacterial gyrase is involved in, helps relieve or relax the supercoils, right? Now, why is this important? Because it's a wonderful, unique target for antimicrobials, right? So, and that's why I want you to remember it for the exam. So, let's put in red, you guys, that bacterial gyrase will be inhibited by, by antibiotics. And the one I would like you to remember, folks, it's, it's called a fluoro, fluoroquinolone. And the specific name is called ciprofloxacin. Cipro, ciprofloxacin? Have any of you heard of cipro? Yeah, right? And cipro became famous several years ago when some demented person was sending anthrax endospores through the mail. Do you remember that? A long time ago, right? And what happens with the anthrax endospores, if you open the package or the envelope, they become aerosolized and you inhale them and then what happens? They germinate in your lungs and then you can quickly die from inhalation anthrax, right? So everybody that potentially was exposed or, or the folks that did develop inhalation anthrax, they were all on ciprofloxacin. So folks, on the exam, I could ask it two ways. Can you name a specific antibiotic that will inhibit bacterial gyrase? Ciprofloxacin, yeah. Or I could ask it in reverse, folks. Ciprofloxacin will inhibit what? <clears throat> Bacterial gyrase. Now, why would that stop the bacillus anthracis from growing, from replicating, right? So if ciprofloxacin is present, bacterial gyrase can't do what? Can't relieve the supercoiling, right? And folks, if the chromosome remains supercoiled, can the bacterium copy the chromosome? Nope. So they can't replicate, right? And we'll see later, you guys, you also need relief of supercoiling for that step involved in protein synthesis called transcription. Okay? All right. Now, on the slide, there's more information, folks, more examples. But I just want you to know the only one I would ask you about on the exam would be ciprofloxacin. But just, just so, because <clears throat> I, I know a lot of you are really interested in pharmacology. Um, um, the bigger, broader category folks, of, of um, antimicrobials that target the DNA gyrus are called quinolones. One of them, an older one, is called maledixic acid. Will I ask this on the exam? Yeah. Right? And then of the derivatives of fluoroquinolone, the one, the one that's broad spectrum, right, can, can kill a wide um, variety of bacteria uses ciprofloxacin, right? And again, it was used in treatment of um, inhalation anthrax. Another one, I won't ask this one, but norfloxacin. And then later generations, gabafloxacin, gemofloxacin, these are used in both urinary tract and respiratory, 
respiratory tract infections. Will I ask this on the exam? No. Only one you need to remember is Cipro. Okay. <coughs> All right. All right, folks. And, and again, we always try to back up, kind of get the big view, and then we we'll go back in to look at details. So once, folks, the chromosome, the supercoiling has been relieved, right? Now we're going to see, okay, so now what's going to happen? You know, we're going to get that replication bubble. We're going to get our replication fork. So wh what's going to happen? So this is the big overview. So we want to remember, folks, what's the enzyme that copies DNA? What's the enzyme that copies the DNA? DNA polymerase, good. It, um, in which direction is DNA synthesis? Five prime to three prime, good, folks. And we have our template strand. So the new strand that's being synthesized, is it parallel to the template or anti-parallel? Good, anti-parallel. Is DNA um, synthesis bidirectional? Yes. Now, here's some weird things, you guys, that right now might not make any sense. So um, DNA synthesis is initiated. To initiate means to start something, right? So it's so bizarre. DNA synthesis is going to be initiated by a little short RNA primer. What's that all about? We'll talk about it. And then, folks, on our double-stranded chromosome, there's going to be um, two new strands that are being synthesized. One will be called the leading strand, and it's synthesized by um, continuous DNA synthesis. The other strand is called the lagging strand, and it's synthesized by discontinuous DNA synthesis. We'll come back and explain all of these. The lagging strand is going to be synthesized in short little DNA fragments called Okazaki fragments, right? And then um, kind of the final cleaning up of, the, of our uh, chromosome the RNA primers will be removed by a special DNA polymerase, and then those little DNA fragments, the Okazaki fragments, are going to be covalently linked together by an enzyme called DNA ligase. So you guys, this is the overview, and now it'll probably take at least an hour. We're going to walk through each of the steps and talk about each of the um, each each of these steps. Okay. So now, folks, this is where I'm going to go and. Um, draw a replication fork on the board. And I want to apologize ahead of time, folks. This is a dynamic process. And what makes folks frustrated is I get to erase, right? And you're, you're doing your notes, and you don't get to erase. So I just want to apologize ahead of time that I know this can be really frustrating. OK. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at a replication fork in E. coli. We're just going to look at one replication fork. And I'm going to keep my, my problems list up here. Because we're going to, the poor little E. coli solves one problem and has another problem. Okay, so we're going to have some more problems to solve. And I hope, I hope this will be on the screen. So folks, let's see here. Um, so this will be Ori here. This will be my old parental double-stranded DNA. Here's my replication fork. Excuse me, this is my replication bubble. This is the replication fork we're going to focus on. Okay. So the, um, the next problem the little E. coli is going to encounter, folks, is now the chromosome is um, relaxed. It's not supercoiled, but it needs single-strand DNA templates. What does it have to start with? Double-stranded DNA, right? So this is the old parental double-stranded DNA, right? Held together, right, by hydrogen bonds. So the next problem is what? How do we go from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded templates? We have to unzip the double-stranded DNA, right? And what do we mean by unzip? Break the hydrogen bonds, right, between complementary bases. So you guys, so the little bacterium has evolved an enzyme that works like the zipper pull here, right? And that, that bacterial equivalent is called helicase, right? So the problem is we have to unzip the double-stranded DNA to make the single-strand templates. And folks, what, how did the bacteria solve this? What's the solution? 
the enzyme called helicase. You take a helix and you're breaking it apart, right? Like like unzipping, right? So so we have helicase, right? Breaks the hydrogen bonds between complementary bases. So we could say it unzips the double-stranded DNA to make our single-strand DNA templates. Does that make sense, folks? So the helicase is going to be working, and this is just, this is really crude cartoon, folks. I'm going to have my helicase working right here at the replication fork. So there's our helicase. So it's moving along, breaking the hydrogen bonds, creating the two double-stranded, um, excuse me, creating the two single-strand templates. Good. All right. All right, so now I've got my two single strands. But folks, there's some problems here because single-stranded DNA, it, could it come back together again, right? We call that re-annealing. The two strands could come back together, forming their hydrogen bonds. So that, this is going to be the third problem, you guys. So the single-strand templates could, and there's a number of problems here, you guys, so they could re-anneal. What does that mean? They come back together, forming double-stranded DNA. So all that work was for naught, right? They could tangle, or they could be destroyed by enzymes. All right, so these, these single strands, they could re-anneal, come back together, they could tangle, or bacteria have evolved enzymes that recognize single-strand DNA as possible viral DNA. So uh, bacteria have evolved enzymes to destroy single-strand DNA, to cut it up, right? So that's a problem. So the solution is the bacteria have evolved. And I'll, I'll try to point it out here, you guys, in the little cartoon. So um, here's our helicase, folks. And these little blue blobs here, these are what we call single-strand binding proteins. Their job is to bind to the single-stranded DNA and do what? Protect, protect the single strands. So they bind to the, they bind to, they bind to and protect the single strand DNA templates. Okay. So we'll just, we'll just put a few in here, you guys. So these are the SSBPs. What are they doing? Are they binding to the single-strand DNA templates, preventing them from re-annealing, preventing them from tangling, very importantly, protecting, protecting them from being destroyed by the bacterial enzymes? Does, does that make sense, folks, so far? OK. All right. Now, um, you would say, OK, now the cytoplasm is chock full of nucleoside triphosphates, right? You got your DNA polymerase in the cytoplasm. So you could probably argue, well, okay, now can we finally start synthesizing some DNA? You know, DNA polymerase, get in there, right? Start using the, start using the single strand DNA as a template, right? And start synthesizing your complementary DNA. Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. And the next problem is, folks, is that DNA polymerase just can't bind to single-strand DNA and start synthesizing complementary DNA. It has to have a short, what we call primer, a short little nucleic acid sequence to get it started. So this is a fourth problem, right? DNA polymerase requires a nucleic acid primer to initiate, to start, to initiate, initiate just means to start DNA synthesis. So this is kind of a pickle, okay? What's a little cell supposed to do? Well, luckily, there's another uh, family of enzymes in the bacteria called RNA polymerases. What do you think RNA polymerases make? RNA, right? RNA polymerases don't need a primer. RNA polymerases just need a single-stranded DNA. They'll bind to it and start synthesizing what? 
RNA, right? They'll start synthesizing RNA. And so, folks, there is a special RNA polymerase called primase. So primase, it's an enzyme, and what does it make? A primer, right? Primase, and this is a special RNA polymerase makes a short RNA primer for who? Who's who's the um, who's the RNA primer for? For DNA polymerase, right? So you have cooperation between the enzymes. Isn't that crazy, folks? So let us pretend, and this is where I start, I should have brought more toys. So you guys, let's pretend that, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's pretend this is my primase of science, right? It's going to bind to the single strand DNA, and I'll just put, I'll put a base sequence in here, folks. I'll put a bunch of these just so we can see. Okay. Here's our DNA template, and let's pretend, you guys, this is primase. Primase is going to bind, and it's going to start synthesizing a short RNA primer. Let's put the RNA primer in red. Okay, and this was made by primase. So, folks, what would the base sequence be of our RNA primer? Okay, so it's using the single-strand DNA as a template, as a guide. So U, U, A, A, G, C. Good. So folks, when the RNA prime, excuse me, when the primase is made a short little primer, and I'll just say, say like a dozen nucleotides long, now who can take over? DNA polymerase, right? Pretty ugly, but that's all right. So as soon as that short little RNA primer has been made, now DNA polymerase can knock primase off and do what? Start synthesizing what? What's black going to be? Is that DNA? Right? And who's making that? The workhorse of DNA synthesis in um, bacteria, in E. coli, there's a number of DNA polymerases, you guys, they have Roman numerals. So the workhorse of DNA synthesis in E. coli is called DNA polymerase 3. And they're numbered in the order they were discovered. It doesn't necessarily mean the numbers represent how much work they're doing, okay? All right, so you guys hear that, let's just, just so we have, um, kind of make a complete list here. So. We could say the next problem is how to make um, DNA. So the next problem is how to copy DNA into DNA, right? And what was the solution, folks? What was the enzyme? DNA polymerase, and the number will become important. DNA polymerase way. Good. DNA, the workhorse of the cell. This little guy does most of the DNA synthesis. And what we'll finish with, folks, is once DNA polymerase 3 gets started, now it, it goes along, it knocks off the single-strand binding proteins, right? And once it gets started, it just keeps going and going and going and going and going, right? So it's going to make our complementary DNA, and it's just going to keep going all the way around until it gets to TER. So this, folks, this is called continuous DNA synthesis, because once DNA polymerase starts, does it stop? Nope, it just keeps going, so continuous DNA synthesis. And consequently, this strand, folks, is called the leading strand. It's like there's a race going on, and this strand, because once DNA polymerase gets started, it's going to win the race, right? Now, we're out of time, folks, but let me just, in contrast, tell you, back down here, we're going to have problems. And the problem is, if we look at the orientation up here, okay, remember how we said DNA, um, nucleic acid synthesis is always 5 prime to 3 prime, right? So this is the 5 prime end, this is the 3 prime end, it has to be anti-parallel. So this is our template 5 prime here, if we cut it up here, it will be 3 prime here. 
we're going to have all kinds of headaches because on this opposite template strand, the orientation is reversed. And that's going to cause massive headaches for the little bacterium. Okay? So when we get back on Tuesday, and half of you will be exhausted from the lab exam, and the other half will be totally stressed out because you have the lab exam, right? We're going to talk about this much more complicated way of synthesizing the opposite strand, the so-called lagging strand of DNA, which is made by discontinuous DNA synthesis, okay? But at least we got through the easy one. Okay, folks, so I'll see half of you at one. Some of you I might see an open lab tomorrow. Um, and to all of you guys, have a good, good weekend, okay? And I hope you can get some, a little bit of rest in there, okay? Oh, I know. Exam. Oh, no, not yet, not yet. But, but yeah, <laughs> but lab exam, right? Lab exam. Oh.